Now, we have among us uh, in this, this, this great polyglot delegation of foreigners that has, has descended on us tonight, we have one, one official foreigner, and he's, a, he's as polyglot as can be. He's our Taft delegate, Transatlantic Fan Fund. Uh, this, you know, is, is a kind of uh, reverse lend-lease that brings us uh, the, the refuse of the old world now and then. <laughs> uh, this time around, uh, the sweep of the wave has brought us a German resident who is uh, Italian, I believe, by citizenship and part Yugoslavian and part Mongol by ancestry. Uh, one Mario Bosniak. Uh, I first met Mario at the, the St. Louis Convention of 1969 when he came equipped with several bottles of a strange green substance. <laughs> and inveigled some of us up to his room and said, uh, you vote for Haikan, we give you Vaguts. <laughs> Vaguts was the green substance. Uh, I, I had some and was, was immediately transformed into Harlan Ellison for about... <laughs> for about 10 minutes, and let me tell you, that was a bummer. <laughs> anyway, Mario was, was uh, one of the guiding spirits of, of last year's uh, Heidelberg Science Fiction Convention. And uh, as though in, in reparations for that, he's come back this year as our Taft delegate. Mario, come up here and greet the, the assemblage. Uh, I didn't know that I was supposed to speak tonight, and I lost my few words the first day of the convention. And I think at that moment I say the most important to everybody of you. And I think there are much, much more important items going on tonight uh, instead of holding silly speech. I would only repeat my <coughs> deep thanks to everybody of you who made this possible. And I would also like to ask you, everybody, you and your friends, for the next staff race to vote, no matter for whom, but vote. And in this way, show your uh, enthusiasm for this beautiful organization. I myself uh, am the administrator for Europe for two years and I will do my best to get more and more votes over there. Uh, there is only one thing I would like to say. This is a gorgeous convention. This is a beautiful hotel. And it was a pleasure for me to enjoy uh, these days and I'm very sad that tomorrow evening everything will, will go to end. I would like again to express my thanks to Tony and his charming wife and Stu and his charming wife to all the presents to all who helped to make it so beautiful that it's really sad to go away thanks you so much thank you Mario a uh, man of few words uh, not so much a polyglot as a miniglot tonight uh, we have another uh, alien among us. Uh, you know, TAF is, is, is a kind of formal tradition in the, the science fiction convention. We've, there's a TAF race every year. It's an elective honor, uh, very competitive. People get pe petitions up and all of that. Well, aside from the TAF, there is now and then a, a kind of private subscription project to bring over some, some selected species representative from another land who uh, either doesn't have the courage to run for TAF or who uh, is ineligible for, for reasons of health. Uh, they did one of those this year. They brought over a man from, from Northern Ireland, a uh, name of Shaw, Bob Shaw, who uh, sort of a part-time science fiction fan from the, the Eofanish era and has now deviated into writing science fiction. Uh, he has uh, this, this notion of slow glass, which made a couple of pretty good stories that some of you may remember. Uh, Bob Shaw was, was imported, duty-free, by a, a, a supplementary non-TAF TAF. And he, of course, was the only candidate in the, the Bob Shaw Fund, although I understand 
that occasionally he would wake up at four in the morning in a cold sweat saying, what if I lose the Bob Shaw Fund? <laughs> anyway, he's that big man with the beard down there beyond that big man with the beard. And I'd like Bob Shaw to come up and, and say a word or two now. Thank you. Um, well, I don't want to bore everybody to death slowly with a, a long speech. So what I'm going to do is bore you to death quickly with a short speech. <laughs> um, uh, if, I've enjoyed this trip tremendously. The only thing I was, had slight reservations about in advance was that um, people had told me that um, science fiction fans don't drink very much at conventions anymore. <laughs> well, I don't know about the science fiction fans, but there's somebody around here putting it away. <laughs> uh, we had a little party in my room last night, and uh, as far as I can see, we used up a case of scotch. But, um, and this morning I suffered a bit. Oh, it's all right. I, after I had my usual breakfast of uh, two lightly poached aspirins. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but, uh, I should say something about the uh, the method by which I was able to make this um, very long and very enjoyable trip from Ireland. Um, actually, I've been. Uh, I entered science fiction fandom for purely selfish reasons. Um, I just simply wanted to enjoy myself, and I liked writing. And uh, I've been having a great time for the last 20 years, um, giving odd little pieces to science fiction magazines. And uh, I think it's a great tribute to the generosity of people like, well, American fandom in general, and. Um, People like Arnie and Joyce Katz and Rich and Brown, Rich Brown and Colleen, um, that they should con even consider the idea that I should have been rewarded for enjoying myself. That just doesn't seem quite right. But um, I'd like to thank them in particular and everybody else for uh, enabling me to come here and have such a good time. Thank you. It's time to begin shoveling out some of the awards that we propose to hand out tonight. Not you, because they're still hours away. <laughs> uh, we have a brand new one for openers tonight. Uh, it's the Pat Terry Award for Humor in Science Fiction. Uh, Pat Terry was an uh, Australian octogenarian with a robust sense of humor and who uh, went to his eternal reward some time back. Uh, Gordon R. Dixon, a man of jolly humor, will, if he is able to manage it, advance, <laughs> advance to the podium uh, to present the first annual Pat Terry Award for Humor in Science Fiction. Uh, that, that's Gordy Dixon now. I'm very pleased about this particular award. It, uh, it goes to a man whose writing I like. It's named in honor of a man I like very much. And more than that, I think we need an award for humor. Now, this first one was uh, this particular one. Well, I'll hold it up and you can see it. It's in the shape of a, of a pewter mug with inscriptions on it. And there's a can of uh, Australian beer, the kind Bob was talking about. It. <laughs> no, I don't think this has a wombat on it. It has a flag. Um, this was... Uh, well, I'll tell you a little bit how it, was, how it came about first. The uh, Sydney Science Fiction Foundation are the people who got together on the idea of giving this award in the first place. And it was given last year to John Sladek for mechanism, or uh, the reproductive system, I believe it came out, was the title it came out under in this country. And this year, it will be going, well, I'll give you that a little later. What I want to do is tell you a little bit about Pat Terry, very briefly. A very remarkable man. As Bob said, he was in his 80s when he died. And uh, he'd been paralyzed completely in his early 70s. 
And for 11 years, he was confined to a bed, unable to move. People had to, had to move him. They tried an experimental operation on him and got the nerves in his legs to working again. And in his early 80s, after being bedridden for 11 years, he got up and taught himself to walk again. Not only to walk, but to get out of the place where he lived, he had to climb two flights of stairs to the street and then walk some distance from there to the post office, which he went to regularly. He was a man whose humor never quit. He did something I've never seen any other living human being do, and that is he could write letters with an Irish accent. Now, I can't describe how this is done. You just, maybe we'll have a letter on display sometime so you can see. At any rate, this year the award goes to Ron Goulart for After Things Fell Apart, and it will be accepted by Terry Carr, who was the editor for that book. Oh, Gordy left the notes of his speech up here. Let's look through it and see if there's anything incriminating. <laughs> it's not even in English. <laughs> the next award has been canceled by popular demand. It was the, the Abby Hoffman Award for Social Relevance. <laughs> we were going to give it to Harlan, but he couldn't make it. Uh... We do a number each year called the Big Heart Award. Uh, kind of a soft and tender interlude in this otherwise bleak and cynical operation. A uh, man in Ackerman, who lives out in the earthquake zone, uh, operates the, the Big Heart Award. And since Fari didn't quite disappear into the San Andreas Fault this year, he's making his way slowly and painfully to the dais and will now award the 1971 Big Heart Award. There are a number of fans here this evening who probably in prowling the huckster rooms in the last few days have picked up a book by the late E. Everett Evans called Food for Demons. Uh, the title incidentally doesn't refer to the banquet we have just enjoyed. <laughs> There are those among you who will remember E. Everett Evans not only as a science fiction author whose work you've enjoyed, such as The Man of Many Minds and Alien Minds and The Planet Mappers, but uh, Johnny Millard, for instance, a survivor here from the Second World Science Fiction Convention 30 years ago in 1940, I know will have good reason to remember E. Everett Evans. I look out, I see other faces to whom this gentleman was very generous as a fan. There is uh, Walt Liebscher, uh, Sam Moskowitz, Don Walheim. Well, we lost Ev about a dozen years ago, and he had such a big heart that we decided we never wanted to quite forget his generosity, and we looked about for people who themselves have operated in the Evans syndrome doesn't matter whether you're a pro or a fan, sometimes it has been a mixture, such as uh, Bob Block, who was the very first recipient. Later on, Bob Tucker. Uh, on the distaff side, there's B. Jo Trimble. You've all seen her giving generously of her time at this convention and know for years past how she's worked on the art show. Uh, recently, we had a winner who's right here at our table this evening in Harry Warner, Jr. We have been international. Uh, Walter Ernsting of Austria won the Big Heart Award several years ago. We've even gone behind the Iron Curtain to a Herbert Heusler. This evening, we're going to honor a gentleman who has been a good Samaritan to many of us in the past. Uh, anytime there's been anything from a, a bleeding hangnail to incipient Twonks disease, I would say that the good doctor was there. We've, we've honored other good doctors, uh, notably Dr. Keller in the past. I'm very sorry that this particular Big Heart a winner, Award winner isn't with us, but I would like at this time to call forward to accept it on his behalf, one of his very good friends, Lou Tabaco, to whom I will present the E. Everett Evans Memorial Award of 1971 to our Good Samaritan science fiction doctor, C. L. Barrett.
on behalf of Doc Barrett and his numerous friends and fandom, it gives me a great deal of pleasure and personal satisfaction to accept for him this honor. Thank you. It is, it is a pity that Doc Barrett couldn't make it here uh, tonight. Uh, Lou, those, those malpractice suits are almost cleared up now, aren't they? <laughs> Uh, let, let's do a few Hugos now. Uh, not, not this year's Hugos, though. Uh, we'll do the 1954 Hugos. Uh, those of you who study your program booklet really closely will notice that the 1954 science fiction convention forgot to award Hugos. Uh, that's true. I'm not putting you on. Uh, there's a man reading his booklet right down there. And it says 1960, 1954, no award. I'm not sure how this happened. It was out in San Francisco. They, they were having a lot of trouble with, with earthquakes that year, and I guess they were distracted at a critical moment. So uh, a few of us got together, and we decided to award the 1954 Yugos tonight. <laughs> They all go to Harlan, but he isn't here. <laughs> well, okay. We'll mail them to him. Let's do some guests of honor now. The first one of them is the fan guest of honor. Uh, strictly speaking, he is a professional of sorts since he writes for a living. Uh, every day he writes the Hagerstown Times Herald Journal Express, which is their, their newspaper. It's 32 pages. Uh, he starts page one with the national news, the rapes, the weather forecast, and all the rest, and continues right through to the sports and the financial stuff on page 32. And then he goes home and writes letters of comment to fanzines. He's also, he's also written some science fiction stories, and not lately, and had them professionally published, even as many others of us. He has the reputation in fandom of being rather a nice guy, sweet, gentle, uh, something of a trial for Toastmaster like myself, whose style depends on uh, a certain sharpness of approach. But I've done a lot of research on Harry Water, and I can tell you that none of it's true. Uh, Sam Moskowitz filled me in on all the details. The, 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 the strange sexual practices, the whips and chains. The, the youthful membership in the Communist Party not quite repented. The, the, the thefts of, of Frank R. Paul illustrations from the primitive auctions of the world conventions of the, the, the late 1920s. He's really had a checkered career, and he's been fooling us all lately. Uh, Sam is now working on the definitive biography of Harry Warner, and as soon as he, he clears it with his lawyer, it will be published in the next issue of Science Fiction Plus. <laughs> Uh, Harry, Harry Warner, uh, fan guest of honor, a really uh, important figure in the history of science fiction fandom, a man who has published one fanzine continuously through the, the Fantasy Amateur Press Association since, I think, 1941 or 1942, who prior to that published another fanzine that, that is considered one of the, the, the great uh, spaceways, who has has provided historical continuity through his, his monumental history of fandom from 1912 through 1922, uh, all our yesterdays. He's working on later volumes now. Harry Warner, Jr. Bob Silverberg has learned to do two things in the last 10 years. He's learned to write some tremendous science fiction stories, and he's learned to write and to tell some tremendous lies about me. Uh, this is not going to be a very long talk. If you read Bob Tucker's introduction to all our yesterdays, you know that I'm not much of a talker. And there's another reason for making it a short talk. I'm directing it only to part of the people in this room just to the people who want the nation to continue its space program. If the comments I've been reading in fanzines are a good indicator, not more than perhaps 50 or 60 percent of all fans and professionals are solidly behind continued exploration of space. 
but I think that group could have a major impact on the nation's future course. We thought we were on the threshold of space travel a decade ago when the first orbital missions were flown. Now it's obvious that we've come to a crossroads before we're very far past that threshold. As things now stand, the United States won't be continuing to explore the moon systematically, or setting up a permanent colony there, or training astronauts for the first human landing on Mars for many, many years to come. If we do limit the space program to experiments in orbit around Earth, one of two things will happen, either of which would be bad. All humanity might stay cooped up on one planet until pollution or catastrophe or war makes the planet uninhabitable. Or another nation might go ahead with a space program of its own and move so far ahead in technology that the establishment of this nation will suddenly become panicky and belligerent over its number two status. I think a time for a decision on space may be at hand. A national election occurs next year. Peace could come in Vietnam before the election. A lot of decisions about national policies, such as space travel, could come up in the months just ahead. If only half the people in Phantom and Protom want us to keep on going in space, and if they express their opinion in the right ways, it might have an impact on national policy. I doubt if half of all the people in fandom gave a damn about Star Trek, but those who cared were responsible in part for keeping an imaginary spaceship going for another year or two. About 10% of all the professional people in science fiction were responsible for turning a specialized kind of fiction for boys into a significant branch of adult literature. I'd like to see if pros and fans who back the nation's space program can keep it going. Most lobbyists for space flight are directly interested in making money out of it. Science fiction people are interested in space not for personal gain, but because it's so closely bound up with their main interests. You can write to your congressman or you could publish a fanzine favoring an all-out space program, or you could simply talk up space on street corners. Just remember, two summers ago, most of us got pretty badly worked up when we saw a man take his first step on the surface of the moon. It's quite possible that next year we'll see man take his last step on the moon for a generation or two. I'd like to see science fiction people do what they can to prevent that from happening. Thank you. Harry, we, we, we thank you for that uh, somewhat somber but uh, important reminder. We have here for you, so that you do not uh, let this occasion slip your mind, a flat Yugo of sorts. <laughs> it's a, a glittering plaque that says Harry Warner Jr., Fan Guest of Honor, Norris Khan, 1971. I would have gone on now to the 1932 Yugos, but the voting's not finished. <laughs> uh, the, other, the other guest of honor, Clifford D. Simak. This is really a tough business tonight, giving me two guys like this to introduce, because Clifford D. Simak is the Harry Warner Jr. of Prodom. <laughs> I mean, he, he, he's a benevolent man. He, he, he exudes goodness and the milk of human kindness. And it is really a challenge to, to say something unkind or even barbed about Cliff Simak. Uh, I'm going to try, but... <laughs> He's also a newspaper man. He works for the, the, the Minneapolis Bugle, <laughs> which is published in a limited hectographed edition <laughs> in St. <Saint> Paul. <laughs> he, uh, he is the, the silage and 
Sorghum's columnist. <laughs> a few years ago, uh, Barbara and I were out in uh, the Twin Cities, and we called on, on Cliff's uh, office, saw him in his uh, function as journalist. He was off in the corner there pushing computer buttons and, and, and making things dance and hop. And he showed us how a great city newspaper is run. It's, it's all done by uh, mirrors and lies and imagination. And, uh, and then we went out to dinner and, and, and Cliff told us anecdotes about the editors he has dealt with in his nearly 40 years as a science fiction editor. And pals, I just can't repeat those stories. Not in front of a mixed audience. You think Cliff Simic is saintly, don't you? You think he is a sweet, kindly, well, let me tell you. Behind this facade of mild humanitarian benevolence, there lurks, uh, well, an Asimov in disguise. Uh, <laughs> A, 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 a gray-haired, beaming Ellison hammering to get out. <laughs> I mean, don't, don't take him at face value. When he writes these kindly old stories that begin with the line like Sam Jones was sitting on his front porch in the wheelchair, <laughs> beware, because there's a, there's a barb at the tail of the story somewhere. It's, it's not as folksy as it sounds. Uh, Cliff Simak began writing science fiction somewhere around the time Isaac reached puberty and has continued ever since, uh, picking up acclaim and Hugo's and a great deal of money along the way. Uh, a book called City, which uh, is probably out of print now because that's the way things happen in this business. Uh, one of the, the undying classics of science fiction. If, if any, any list of the 20 science fiction novels were drawn up, it would have to have City on it. He wrote a bunch of other stuff too, maybe you've, you've read it, according to the checklist in the program book that most of that is out of print too. I think Cliff should have a long talk with his publishers. Uh, although he does date as a writer from the Gernsback era, believe it or not, he's one of those rare birds who has managed to stay with it, to evolve, to remain active and alert, and still a, a cherished contributor to science fiction here in his fourth or fifth decade among us as a, a writer. And long overdue, he has been chosen tonight as our professional guest of honor. Clifford D. Simak. Bob, for all the nice things you said about me. <laughs> Mr. and Mrs. Lewis, Mr. and Mrs. Silverberg, Mr. Warner, distinguished guests and member, members of the committee, ladies and gentlemen. I am deeply appreciative of the honor of standing here tonight. Thank you for having me. Of late years, there have been some derogatory things said of science fiction. Tonight, I propose to say some decent things about it. And in speaking of science fiction, I should emphasize perhaps that the, under the heading, I also include fantasy, sword and sorcery, and any other category into which the field may be splintered. I have heard it said that science fiction has lost its sense of wonder, that too many bad stories are being written, that much of it is unreadable. I think that people who say these things may be basing their judgment, judgments on too shallow a perspective. In some cases, it may be their bias rather than their critical judgment that comes into play. To make such a judgment, it seems to me that we should take the long view, that we should go back to the early 30s and take a closer look at what has happened in our field. Let us go back to the days of the mad scientist, to the time of the bug-eyed monster, to the era of the man-eating plant. 
from such a position in the past and looking forward to the present day, I would venture that any fair-minded observer would be willing to admit that we had chalked up some progress. But, you say, there was a sense of wonder then. I grant you that. We were starry-eyed in those days. It was all so new and wonderful, and we were very young. The sense of wonder, my friends, was never in the stories, but only in ourselves. It is we, tired and jaded from having read so much, who have lost the sense of wonder. I have never raised a question, but I would guess that even now, the sense of wonder still exists among those young readers who may have been newly introduced to science fiction. And the bad stories, what about those, you ask? Aside from the fact that whether a story is bad or good is a matter of personal taste and critical judgment, and applying only a crude rule of thumb criterion, if you look back to the beginning of modern science fiction, you will realize there have always been bad stories. I am quite willing to admit that I have written more than my fair share of them. There isn't a writer here tonight who hasn't a few stories to his credit that he'd be happy to forget. Science fiction in this wise is no different than any other type of fiction. If you don't believe me, read some of Faulkner's early efforts and some of Hemingway's, not to mention Fitzgerald and many others. I would hazardly guess that if a panel of competent critics were to make a survey of science fiction through the years, the, through the years, they would find far more praiseworthy pieces of fiction writing in the last few years than in any previous period. And that does not exclude the so-called golden age of science fiction. And when you get around to those unreadable stories, you must not lose sight of the fact that whether a story is readable or unreadable depends entirely upon the person reading it. This is an extremely nebulous area in which to make a judgment. I will mention no names or titles, for I should be ashamed to. But I must confess that for me there are certain stories that are unreadable. The horrible thing about this is that some of them have been critically acclaimed as masterpieces. No doubt they are, but I still can't read them. And yet, I consider that it would be impudent and perhaps even a little stupid of me to go about proclaiming them as unreadable. Aside from all of this, I see many hopeful signs for science fiction, and I think that they should not be overlooked. A number of new writers who have entered the field in recent years gives me considerable hope that the old tradition forged back in the 30s and 40s will not only be carried on, but enriched and strengthened. This gives me more satisfaction than I can possibly express, for it means that something that old timers like Edmund Hamilton and Jack Williamson and many others helped to build will rise to greater heights than any of us could have dreamed back in the days of the far beginning. It also makes me think that there must be something viable and vital in the field to attract such talent. The one thing that has been most attractive about science fiction through the years is that it has provided a framework in which a writer can say certain things he wants to say and to a better advantage than in any other form of writing. It is a forum for ideas and it is essential that it attract new talent if it is to continue in this function. Another encouraging aspect of recent years is the emergence of a fairly large body of responsible critical assessment. In years past, we had only a few critical voices. Today, we have a score or more. And as the years go on, there's reason to believe this number will grow. I take this to mean that the body of literature we have developed finally has been judged competent of critical notice. For a writing form that had such humble beginnings to achieve such notice, triumph. 
tied in with this critical assessment has been the acceptance that has been given science fiction in our schools, both at the high school and college level. If our work is a judge of a value that makes it acceptable in the classroom, we may be well content that it indeed has made some progress. I regard also as hopeful the evidence in the last few years that the field has the capability of responding to evolutionary ferment. When any endeavor, be it literature, politics, economic, engineering, or science, becomes frozen in a status quo beyond which its practitioners fear to move, that endeavor has reached a dead end. I think we have rather recently developed, demonstrated we have reached no dead end. A few years ago, there was a great controversy and a fierce outcry over the so-called new wave writing. I am not entirely sure, even now, I know what the new wave was or is. I think I know something about it, but probably I fail of complete understanding. I do not think complete understanding is necessary to see what has happened or may still be happening. I may be wrong, but it seems to me that the new wave has become, or is in the process of becoming, a very important part of science fiction. Our field of writing seems to have had the capacity to absorb and offer a place to this new way of writing, being made the richer for it without in any way being forced to give up the old traditional and basic values. We were faced by a change and accepted it and made it a part of us. In somewhat less spectacular fashion, science fiction in the past has responded to changes and some sure instinct in us has always managed to make these changes an improvement while the basic spirit of the literary form was retained. Back in the late 30s, the old format was replaced by more nationalistic writing. Sometimes in the, sometime in the middle 40s or thereabouts, we began to write about politics, economics, ethics, and other matters that had not before been given room in the old format. And while these changes stand out sharply in my mind, there were, as the years went on, other changes just as significant. The point is that science fiction has been and still is flexible. And within that flexibility lies its greatest promise. There's just one thing further that I would like to say. I say it with all the goodwill in the world. I am well aware that controversy, representing many points of view, is a healthy thing. When we no longer hold differing viewpoints, we will tend to become complacent and may no longer care, and our field and consequence will suffer. But there are times when I am somewhat distressed at the shrillness of some of the controversy. I could wish for the good I could wish for the good of all of us. The discussions might be carried on in a quieter voice and somewhat more reasonably. The field is large and there's room for all of us and for each of our personal viewpoints. There is no overriding urgency for any of us to feel the necessity to convert all the rest of us to our way of thinking. I know that to many of you tonight, my few decent words about science fiction may seem too simplistic. I have stated the obvious, but no one else had seemed about to do it. My affair with science fiction has been a long and devoted one, and in recent times I have cringed at some of the things that have been said of it. What I have said here tonight, I have felt for a long time badly needed saying. Thank you for listening.
There's a good man. He's a pretty good rider, too, but we, we have a lot of good riders. Good men are in shorter supply. He's okay. <laughs>